that is one delicious cup of ketogenic coffee. What is ketogenic coffee, you might say? I'm glad you asked. So um, this month, I've been kind of doing a self-experimentation type of thing uh, at my clinic. I see a lot of weight loss, a lot of diabetes, a lot of metabolic syndrome, a lot of these um, uh, issues of the 21st century, actually the 20th and the 21st century, um, just these horrible medical conditions that are brought upon by the standard American diet, really. The problem with this is that when we start talking about the standard American diet, we start pointing blame at people. We start saying, well, you're the one that caused this. You're the one that did this to yourself. And the, and the answer is no, it's not the case. It's not your fault. You were brought up believing the things that you were brought up to believe. Low fat, low cal, increased exercise, all that sort of thing. So what I decided to do, because anytime I recommend something for my patients, I want to try to put myself through it just to see what, what they go through. So this month, uh, I swore off all sugar, all carbohydrates altogether. Um, I still eat green leafy vegetables. That's about as high as the carbohydrate intake I'll take. Um, we're talking maybe 10 to 20 grams a day. Um, every morning, instead of eating breakfast, I have a ketogenic coffee. What that is, is really just grass-fed butter. Ghee um, is another option. It's kind of like a clarified butter. It's like butter, but uh, it's got a longer shelf life. Coconut oil, and in this particular uh, blend there's a cacao powder i say it looks like cocoa but and it's from the cocoa plant so i don't know cocoa, cocoa whatever it's called um all and that's just has antioxidants and stuff so it's basically a healthy way to start your day it's got fats and it just primes your body to continue burning fats my um uh, ketone levels have gone from the first day i did it they were indetectable undetectable then they went up to like a 0.4 for a few days and 0.6 and then they went up to the 1.4, 1 1.5. And then they dropped down a little bit if I did something wrong to 0.6 again. Well, over the last, I'm on the fourth week, uh, I've jumped up to like 3.5, 3.6. And it's just holding steady. Uh, and I can actually adjust what I eat now. I can add more lean meats like turkey and chicken. Whereas last time I, or earlier in this process, it would knock it right out. So what I'm trying to get at here is a roundabout way to say I am drinking ketogenic coffee and it's got butter in it and it's delicious. Um, if you want to try it out, go to my webpage and you'll see um, this little thing for coffee booster. That's just one type of million. You can t try any kind you want, but I really like coffee booster. Um, it's on my website, uh, weightwhatif.com. Go there and click it and, and see if it's uh, something that you would like to try. Also, because uh, the Wait What If podcast is a, a basically one man show. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, this is my fourth year. I'm trying to upgrade a lot of my equipment, trying to, trying to up this podcast to the next level. I need some help with that. So I'm asking listeners to go to my website, waitwhatif.com and just click on the Amazon affiliate link. If you do that, then, um, I'll get credit for whatever you buy during the day. It won't cost you anything extra just to be sure you're not going to be spending anything extra. I just get credit for driving you to, to, Amazon and then I make like a commission off of that and that will help me that'll help me get um, better equipment and, and allow me to do other things speaking of podcast today's episode and and ironically the whole beginning of this podcast where I talk about ketogenic and, and all that stuff um, that's what today's episode is, is kind of about uh, I have Dr. Ken Berry you can find him at kendyberry.md that's let me back that up you can find him on Facebook slash Ken D Barry, that's just the letter D, Barry, B-E-R-R-Y dot M-D on Facebook. And, and he has a bunch of places you can find him, but that's really, go there and then you'll be able to find him anywhere else. Or if you just Google Ken D. Barry M-D, you, you'll, his stuff will pop up. He's the author of Lies My Doctor Told Me. I read this book because it was recommended to me through, I think someone on Twitter. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was fascinating because he talks a lot about this change in paradigm in the medical system. You know, going from from treating and hammering chronic diseases with medications, which don't get me wrong, in some cases that's important to do, but we're, we're going from this this let's treat these medicines, I mean these um, diseases as aggressively as possible to hey maybe we can prevent these diseases coming on from the get go, and really what that comes down to is relearning what our bodies are meant 
to drive on. Uh, let's take, for example, your car. Your car runs on gasoline. If you decide to put ethanol in your car, it'll probably run for a little bit, but it's going to break down, okay? It needs to run on gasoline. Some cars have the ability to run on both, and there's a combination like E85 or whatever, and that's fine. Consider our bodies the same way. Our bodies are meant to run on certain nutrients, and one of those nutrients is fat. Our bodies can run on fat, but we're not used to doing it. We're like that E85 car. We can run on a, a mixture of two fuel sources, but we're just not used to doing that. So the more we teach our body to be adapted metabolically to this source of fat versus 100% um, glucose, what we're finding is people are doing better with their chronic illnesses. They're, they're either their blood sugars are getting in check, their insulin levels are coming down, their blood pressure is coming down, their weight is coming down. It's just a fascinating thing. The problem is that, is, that process is outside the conventional medical paradigm. So um, Dr. Ken Berry is a, a great uh, spokesman for this, this, this shift in thinking, and he hits it with the sledgehammer with this book. Um, I would highly suggest reading the book. It's great. Um, I'll link it in the show notes and I'll put it on my, my, um, uh, website and all that. Uh, but we had a great conversation, great conversation about the current state of the medical world and where it's, it's hopefully going. And, um, I don't know, I was honored to have him on the show and I hope you enjoy it. You're listening to the Wait What If podcast. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Not bad. How are you doing? Finally, we speak. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? We've been trying to do this for a minute. It happens. That stuff happens. Uh, kind of comes along with the, um, you know, the process, especially when you're when when you know I interview people in the medical profession because I mean, I've spent the last six years of my life in that profession, and I know how how erratic and and time consuming it can be. Absolutely. Um, but what I want to do is I want to open up with I'm going to get just as topical as possible and just talk about the last 20 minutes of my life and then we're going to go from there and and this will make sense in a minute okay okay so Sounds good let's do it all right so i'm a i'm a 41 year old american male i was raised on the standard american diet over the past 20 years um i mean it, when i was in high school and stuff i was i was an athlete but you, you know when you're a teenager you just put whatever whatever's in front of you you eat doesn't matter especially in the in the uh, state school system where it's pizza and um tater tots and stuff like that i just ate whatever right but i was young my metabolism was good i was a wrestler um there therein lies your first clue okay i was a wrestler fast forward uh through the the excess uh, excess uh, hops and barley consumption of college. Um, <laughs> yes, I got out, and uh, you know I was overweight. Um, I wasn't really feeling good. I mean, I was young. I wasn't really feeling good. Um, <laughs> but then I got into the into the military, and in the military, I got into jujitsu, wrestling, long distance running, all the stuff that kind of comes with that culture. Uh, and then I, I started eating, health, at least what I thought was healthy, again, from the convention. I was eating whole grains. I was eating lean meats. I never, I, I haven't, and this is going to shock you, um, except for the last maybe uh, 12 months. Uh, so a race last 12 months, I never sat down and ate an entire steak because hmm. I thought I was doing what was right. Uh, I was never obese, but my I never had, um, even when I competed, my body weight, or my, my I never look at body weight, but my fat percentage would go from 18 to 25. Um, it, it never dropped below that. Okay, this story's going somewhere. <laughs> Just so you know. Okay. All right, so my body fat always fluctuated a little high. I never leaned down, even during competition, but I was good. I was good at competition. I had great um, um, stamina and all that. So get out of the military, stuck with the same thing. Now I start aging, okay? My bones start, my joints start aching, about 35 years old. I got injured in the military, I got out, but I was still competing heavily, and, uh, and I had to give up, I had to give up uh, jiu-jitsu and stuff. So again, sticking with the standard, well, not standard, what, the, the conventional healthy diet, I go to PA school, um, I go through that whole thing, um, and I just, I'm, 
every year I'm feeling worse and worse and worse, even though I'm doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing. I start treating patients, okay? So now I'm done PA school, I'm starting to treat patients, and I'm basically regurgitating the stuff that I was taught and the stuff right. that I was doing, which was totally counterintuitive because it wasn't making me feel better, but I was trying to have my patients do it with zero success. You know, maybe short-term sex, zero success. So now, now this, the next like couple years, we'll say the last two years, let's look at the last 24 months, I start wading into a world of, of uh, shadowy, outside-the-box medical uh, advice. And I start thinking, as a practitioner, uh-oh, what, what am I doing here? Because I start reading things like Rob Wolf's The Paleo Solution, um, Jason Fung's The Obesity Code, and, and all these things that I'm reading about just made complete sense but went 100% against the grain of medical convention, and I, I started to worry. And then from here on out, we'll, we'll kind of go on what happened from there. But does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, it sounds very, very uh, similar to my path mm -hmm. to where I am currently. I started off in uh, all my life, I was a very slim, athletic person. And went through medical school, went through residency, started my practice. And uh, then the 30s kind of happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking back now, you know, I could, I know it was a hormonal shift. And, uh, and there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of drama in my life at that time. And so I, I became that fat doctor okay. that would have to go into exam rooms and tell people, hey, you, need, you know, you're overweight. You need to lose weight. And that's, uh, if you know me, you know that's not my style. Okay. I like to lead by example. I like to, uh, I, I love the saying, do as I do and do as I say. Uh, I'm not the guy that's just going to preach and then not live the, live the, the message. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, you know, I, I basically for the first half of my life, I didn't do anything. I was just athletic. I didn't have to try. Right. But then I looked up one day and I was this fat doctor who got short of breath when I bent over to tie my shoes. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't have that. My triglycerides were going up. My A1C was going up. And I was becoming quickly very unhealthy and a terrible example for all my patients. Now, and up until that time, I, I had thought, well, you know, my patients just aren't following my advice because I was teaching them what I was taught in medical school. You know, right. lots of whole grains, very low saturated fat, lots of carbs, lots of complex carbs. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, well, they're not doing that. They're not doing what I'm telling them to do. So when I became this fat doctor, I thought, well, I've got to tighten up. I can't be, you know, that's a terrible example I'm setting. And so then I, I started to apply the advice that I was giving my patients and gain 10 more pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, True it's story. Sense. And then at that point, I was like, okay, so obviously I'm a hardworking guy. You know, I, I, I'm not afraid of, of hard work and perseverance because I got into medical school. And I finished medical school. Mm -hmm. So the only other thing that could possibly be going on here is that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to nutrition and that sort of thing. Right. So I went back unofficially, went back to school and got a degree in nutrition unofficially. Mm -hmm. And the first book I happened upon was the Atkins Diet, okay. an old uh, tattered paperback I found at a rummage sale for 50 cents. And then I discovered the, the Primal Blueprint by Mark Sisson. Then yep. I read uh, The Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain. And those were kind of the bedrock foundation of what I do now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it was absolutely a, a self-evolutionary process of me becoming the very thing I was preaching my patients to stop being. That's right. And that was kind of my journey. And, and so now I try to lead by giving good advice and good information, but also by example as well. One of the most absurd things that I find myself, or at least I used to find myself doing is, uh, and, and when, I, when I sit down and counsel patients about weight loss, and I've unofficially become an obesity expert only because diabetes, metabolic syndrome, I mean, I'm seeing 75 to 80% of my patients dealing with this. Yes. So yes. I, I'm scheduling hours, you know, let's sit down for an hour talk. And the first thing I do is I draw a little stick figure caveman on one side of the board, and then I draw a long line, and I draw a little round uh, stick figure on the other side. And then I take my, I have a little thin Sharpie, and I just draw a little tiny line about a millimeter before that. And I say, 
you know, and 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 pr- prior to that, where the, where you have the uh, the line or the timeline, it's like three feet long because I have about a four foot board, and then I have about a millimeter where you have the fat guy, and I say this little millimeter right here is where it all changed, and this is what we're dealing with is these these obesity cases, and it's absurd to look at the last seventy five years and try to fix it within that time frame, uh, um, within that that way of thinking. The, yes. it, it only makes sense to me to look back at the 150, the 200,000 years of genetic um, mutations and genetic adaptation to, to help us survive and, and aim for that to fix our, our current problems. But, but conventional medicine doesn't seem to want to do that. Can you explain? Well, it's, it's really the most curious thing that has happened over the last 50 or 60 years when it comes to uh, medical nutrition advice, Mm -hmm. because, you know, as you, as you hinted at, I mean, we've been on this planet for eons and we're always lean and muscular and healthy and vibrant and robust only for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Have we been overweight and tired and stiff and in pain those things were just unheard of before, but the, it, it's just the, the most curious thing of human nature that if you grow up in a condition, mm-hmm. if you're born in, into a societal condition, then that is normal to you, and it's always been that way as far as you can tell. Right. And so it seems that that's the normal, that's the way, I mean, you know, that's obviously the way it should be because your mom and dad did it, your grandparents did it, so why would you even want to venture outside of that little paradigm? And so what happened back in the 50s and 60s basically destroyed the medical nutrition advice that, that doctors give patients and led to, led to the, the diabetes epidemics, mm-hmm. uh, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity, uh, hyperglycemia, prediabetes. All that stuff was virtually unheard of, especially in kids. Oh, yeah. It was just unheard of in kids. In the in the twenties and thirties and forties, it's heartbreaking. Only when, yeah, only when basically when the federal government started sponsoring big sp- studies, and and they were looking for dragons to slay, so to speak, wars to win, uh, and they didn't want to fight another world war, so they were looking for a war that had fewer casualties, and so they found saturated fat and mm-hmm. cholesterol, and that was their dragon they were going to slay and their war that they were going to win. And I, I'm afraid that when we look back in 50 years from now, we're going to realize that they actually had a higher casualty rate in that war than they did in the World War. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. What's, what's strange about it, too, is that um, it, it, it kind of proves that scientists are still faulty humans, right? Oh, um, absolutely, yes. And that's something everybody has to understand. Just because you've got a PhD after your name or you work for the NIH or the CDC, that doesn't make you any less fallible or any less susceptible to all the, the, the fallacies of logic right. that the human mind is susceptible to. It, in some cases, it makes you even more susceptible. And then it makes the people who hear you speak or read what you write – they're very susceptible sure. to believing in the in the power of authority, and just uh, you you become almost a parental figure to them, and they and they suspend their disbelief and just believe what you say blindly, and, and that's what's happened over the last fifty or sixty years. And for my my listeners, what I want them because I, I don't know some of them might not be in the science business, but you want to be or at least the purest form of scientific um, investigation is. You want to be proven wrong. You want to find yes. the holes in your st- in your in your theory, and you want it to be picked apart because you want to find the truth. It's for the the um, you're seeking truth. The only way to have truth is to see if you can prove it wrong. And if you, it's very philosophical, um, which yes. is strange because it's kind of a you know you get philosophy on one <laughs> side and, and science on the other. But um, yeah, the whole point is to be proven wrong. And now right. and now we seem to have have gr- you know. There's a, a groove in society of, you know, what is the convention? What is the convention of, of being healthy and how to eat? And to fluctuate anywhere outside of that, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of resistance. And it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous when I start telling my patients, hey, 
you know, maybe we want to try to cut down your carbohydrate to five to 10%. Let's cut it really, really low and see what we can get your body's metabolism to it to do. See if we can get you to start burning different fuels to, to kind of repair these things. And, and, you know, even though I know the science is there that shows that this works, I am nervous to say it because I grew up in that conventional groove, at least in medicine. Oh, uh, yeah, I totally agree. And I see that all the time. Um, just like the, the, the calorie myth, right? I see people, you know, talking about macros and talking about the fat percentages and they're like, but you know, you don't want to go over your calorie count. It's like, Whoa, what, what? And subconsciously they had to throw that in Mm -hmm. because if they didn't say that, they would feel like somehow that was a sin or a crime against humanity because, uh, you know, everybody believes the calorie myth. So therefore you have to give it its due deference or you could be, I don't know what could happen, but something bad could happen. And so it's so funny when I hear people talking and they're just like, yep, you got it. You understand it. Yes, you're, you're right. And then they throw in something about calories. It's like, mm-hmm. well, <laughs> you're doing so good there for a second. And and I guess I'm I'm slight, I'm, I'm not guilty of it, but I would say that I still, no matter how much, and I kind of did the same thing. I, I got an unofficial uh, nutrition. I'm still in the midst of my unofficial nutrition uh, um, uh, degree, but, yeah. you know, I, I still find myself like there was that guy and I can't think of his name. He was a, um, a British, uh, you would, you might remember him. He was a British, uh, workout guy, whatever. And he decided he did an experiment where he ate 6,000 calories or it was some, you know, random number, 5,624 calories a day of the standard American diet. And he, he figured out that he would gain 16 pounds. Well, the first one he did, he did a paleo type diet, same thing, increased his calorie count to that high amount. And everyone said, you're going to gain about 16 pounds. And at the end of that experiment, he actually only gained two pounds, but he lost two inches from his waist. Mm-hmm. And so everyone said, oh, you just hit the genetic lottery. That's not you know scientific. And then he said, okay, well, let's, let's reset. And then I'm going to do the American diet with the same exact amount of calories and see what happens. And wouldn't you know, he hit 16 pounds and I don't, it, the other numbers are like five inches on his waist and all that, that, that <laughs> stuff there. Exactly. So... So it, for, first, you have confirmation bias in that you're eating extra calories and you're getting fat. So you're kind of thinking, yeah, maybe it is the extra calories, not the diet. But the mm-hmm. second thing that hits me is, you know, I tell people it's not the calories, but I still, here I am with the data in front of me, and I still get nervous about telling people, don't count calories, let's look at the quality of the food you're eating. Mm-hmm. And and many providers, many doctors and practitioners are so nervous about that that even though they might believe it and might say, well, yeah, I think there's something to that, they won't tell patients. That they might even implement it in their own life, but mm-hmm. they're just too nervous to tell patients because, you know, doc- docs and providers can get in trouble. Right. If somebody else decide, you know, just doesn't like you and they report you for that, you can be censored or even, uh, you know, fined or reprimanded by the medical board. Because you're not practicing community standard right. med- medicine, which is a, is a thing that you, I'm sure you know about that. Sure. But a lot of people don't realize if a doctor in a community discovered the absolute secret to just, you know, having 5% body weight, being able to lift your body weight on the bench press and, and never have diabetes, just the secret to mm-hmm. the ultimate optimization of the human creature. And he started telling his patients about that. And I mean, I'm, I'm saying he did discover it is the truth. Okay. And he was too vocal about that. And he advertised it too much. And because, you know, that's how we spread the word these days. Sure. You yeah. know, in the old days, you, you know, it was word of mouth. But now if you, if you would really want to spread a message to people, you advertise. But then the medical board can come in and say, whoa, this is not backed up by any expert opinion. This is not backed up by... Uh, evidence-based medicine, and I, I put air quotes around that because yeah. oftentimes evidence-based is expert opinion. Mm-hmm. And then he could he could be get in real trouble with his medical board, even though he has the answer to the chronic disease in humans. That yeah. that absolutely could happen and has happened. Wow. Yeah, and that's what's frightening. I mean, that's what again. Now I'm going back, to, and and everything is self-reflectory, if that's even a word. But I'm I'm looking. At, at what I'm telling people to do and seeing the results. And yeah, it yes. still makes me nervous. It's, it's one of those, those weird things. <laughs> yeah. But I, if you go into the evidence, though, if you start searching through PubMed and stuff, you can start, you can find this stuff. It's not as, yeah. it's not as open as the uh, Seven Nation study where, yeah. I mean, there's people that can quote that without even looking. But then again, 
and Jason Fung brings this up, uh, Dr. Fung, in his yes. book, is you look at who who's funding these studies. You know, the American Heart Association yes. is taking uh, money to fund their studies from from food corporations. <laughs> it's like right. And yeah, we actually touched on that earlier, and I wanted to come back to that. Mm -hmm. What happened back 50, 60 years ago was that government money got involved. Mm -hmm. And then soon thereafter, corporate money got involved. And you're absolutely right. Science, uh, scientific investigation is a hallowed undertaking. I mean, it is why we are what we are and why we have what we have as humans is when we either just blindly stumble onto stuff or when we discovered things using a good, pure scientific method. But anytime the government throws a $200,000 grant into some scientific research, they never say, here, here's 200 grand, just do whatever you want to with it. it that never happens. Mm -hmm. they want, they're saying, hey, we've got this new initiative. We're trying to lower cholesterol. Here's $200,000. See what you can come up with. And, and you... If you can see how the, the, the well's already poisoned because they've yeah. already told you basically what they need you to find. And the, the unspoken mandate is, is if you don't find what they expect you to find, then you won't get any more $200,000 grants. Right. And so you're effectively done as a research scientist because you've got no money. Right. And then shortly thereafter, the big pharmaceutical houses became involved and they would they could give way more than $200,000 grants for you to research this particular drug or this particular condition. But obviously scientists aren't idiots. They realize quickly, either consciously or subconsciously or unconsciously, I better, you know, it's going to be in my best interest. My paycheck depends on me finding the finding that they probably want me to find. Mm -hmm. And I know to people uninitiated, they think, well, that's just dishonest. That's just lying. But it's much more complicated than that because – when you start playing with numbers and you have huge columns of numbers, you can do little things. And each little step along the way doesn't really feel dishonest. It doesn't really feel like just an abject lie. But when you get to the end result, you've tweaked so many different times that your, your final result really does not reflect reality at all. And you've made the drug company very happy. You, you've become a leader in that field. You're now on the board of the American Heart Association. You've got, you know, you've got medical conditions named after you. And at what point do you say, hey, you know, I kind of made that research up. You don't. <laughs> yeah. That's not human nature. You never do that. You go to your grave knowing in your deepest heart of hearts that you fudge that data. But but it doesn't get hurt too much. I mean, we're probably helping with, you know, giving everybody a statin. So it's probably fine. It's not a big deal. My grandkids are well taken care of. My, my wife is so proud of me. My parents are proud of me. I'm just going to ride this ride, and I'm not going to buck the system. And that's basically how we got from the publishing of the Seven Country Study by Ansel Keys mm -hmm. to where we are today was multiple scientists in a row doing that same thing I just described. Right. Yeah, and when you see results from it, it's hard to. So uh, let's look at saturated fat, for example. Right, we look at saturated fat. We see a correlation with heart disease. Um, as a non-scientist, I look at that and I say, "Oh, okay. I mean, it's black and white. Yeah, higher saturated fat, higher cholesterol, more heart disease." But it, you're right, and, and I guess to explain to the the, the listeners is that if you tweak a, a certain number, like let's say you take out, and I don't know how they did this, but I know there are um, studies about this, where you take out the standard American diet, or you take out that um, high refined carbohydrate um, or, and sugar aspect to it, and then all of a sudden you see the rates of cardiovascular disease drop back down, right? So, right. so exactly. there's a correlation with the saturated fat. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, but it's, it's also dependent on the level of inflammation in the body. So you take that away, and now that saturated fat correlation disappears. And you're not wrong by making that association, but you're not right by ignoring that association. Right, exactly. And it's the same way that uh, the same correlation studies have been used to demonize red meat. Mm -hmm. Because if you've been listening and paying attention at all to the media for the last 30 years, you know red meat's bad for you because right. it's on the news all the time. Right. And so when they do a study of red meat eaters, mm -hmm. right, and they say, look, these guys have much higher rates of heart attack. They have much higher rates of cancer. Look at all this. Well, it's not because of the red meat. It's because of the type of individual 
who would still eat red meat in this modern society. That same guy, he, he's obviously not listening to the authorities. He's ignoring advice. So he probably is also a smoker. He probably also has, you know, drinks lots of alcohol because you're not supposed to do that either. He's basically a rebel. And the only reason he's eating red meat is because he's not supposed to. And so he's doing all these other things that are also bad for him. But when you look at the study and tweak the numbers a little, it looks like red meat causes heart disease and cancer. That's, there's, a, there's a very strong correlation there, but there's no causation whatsoever. Exactly, exactly. And, that, and, and, to get, and there's no reason. There's no reason for the high school math teacher, well, maybe him, but I'm just trying to come up with a random person, <laughs> to not to, to understand that. All they know is that, I mean, I, I consider, my, I used to fly airplanes for the Air Force. I went to, you know, PA school. I, I consider myself an intelligent person. And it wasn't until I was 39 that I finally went, mm -hmm. and this is after, this is after doing, ex, you know, extensive lit reviews and getting into this stuff and writing papers about, uh, well, I, I didn't have much nutrition in PA school, but whatever I did have, and, and just this confirmation bias, yes, this is what it is. This is, you know, red meat is going to lead to this stuff. And then it wasn't until after where I started understanding, you know, where you can, I, I don't want to say fudge the numbers, because that does add a little bit of uh, like a, a nefarious attempt at a mm -hmm. conspiracy. But it is, it, it's not... I think I, I put it good. You're not being dishonest, but you're not being entirely honest. You're afraid. Right. You're afraid to destroy your own house of cards, and, and I understand that. Um, I think. I think Nina. I'm going to mess up her name. Nina Tycholes. Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She. I love her. I. She had mentioned that, and she. And what was funny about her, and and she had mentioned uh, the red meat and the the rebels. What was funny about her is that she was your typical. I think she was like a Portland liberal. Okay, you know, West yes, Coast yes, Portland yes. liberal, and then she actually came and said, "Hey, do you know what? Red meat is <laughs> isn't bad, and um, these farming techniques can actually be good for raising meat and having more people eat meat because it's it's." Um, it's more sustainable, it's more energy friendly. And, and <clears throat> I guess what I'm bringing up with that is I think the tide is starting to change. And that's my next question. Do you see this starting to, with your peers and your colleagues, do you see this, this way of thinking, um, we'll call it ancestral dieting, going back to what our, our DNA tells us to do? Do you see that starting to trickle in with them or well, are you getting pushback? Well, I think that, um, both in my with my local medical community i'm not seeing any traction whatsoever they not only don't know but most of them just don't care and that's the that is the very common uh, way of thinking i think for the average doctor or provider <clears throat> who's ensconced in his little community he's considered a leader and he's very comfortable in his practice and he's very comfortable prescribing his pills and he likes it when the drug reps flirt with him and and buy his office staff lunch. He's not interested in actually, you know, groundbreaking revolutionary things that could completely 180 his patient's health. He's not really even interested in that. It's not that he's a bad person. It's not that he's evil. There's no conspiracy. He's just a guy who's comfy. And when guys get comfy, they tend to not want to be moved. And everybody's familiar with this if you just get comfy on the couch and you're all settled in you got your big bowl of cheetos and the game's about to come on and then your wife comes in and says hey you forgot to take out the garbage <laughs> right you're like oh man uh, i just got comfortable okay fine and then you're kind of fl frustrated with that it's, it's it's just that same concept applied to a doctor who's very comfortable and successful in his medical practice and if i come in and say dude the medical advice you've been given for the last 20 years is crap the nutrition advice is absolute crap. You need to change all that. The benefit is, is you can really save your patient's lives and, and limbs. But the bad thing is you're going to have to stop doing and saying everything you've said and done. You're going to have to start doing something else. And you're going to have to do a ton of reading. And you're going to have to basically go back to med school. No doc wants to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> and so most docs are coming along, if at all, very begrudgingly. Sure. Um, but – I'm on the national scene, there are some, you know, big luminaries who are standing up and saying, enough, this is ridiculous. Let's start making sense with the advice we give our patients about prevention and nutrition. And let's stop just saying things that are either, you know, we heard on the evening news or we read in the conclusion of some far, big pharma sponsored study or that the cute drug rep told me last week. <clears throat> let's actually start thinking about 
the advice we give our patients. And I think that for people like you and me who look at this stuff and read about it and study it all the time, it feels like this is becoming mainstream. But what I want everyone out there to know is this is nowhere close to mainstream, but I fully believe it can become mainstream. I, I think that we're right almost to a tipping point, not quite, but almost to a tipping point where this is going to become a huge deal and it's going to revolutionize medicine and the nutrition advice we give. And it's going to actually change the curve of, of the obesity epidemic and the, the type 2 diabetes epidemic. It's going to make that curve start going the other direction. This stuff that we're talking about has the power to do that. Sure. It has the power to put billion-dollar pharmaceutical companies out of business. It has the power to give patients back their health and, and make grandmothers want to get out in the yard and play with their grandkids again because they feel like doing that again, and they're, they're not 200 pounds overweight anymore. That's what we're playing with here. We've actually, you know, we just we've stumbled across this almost this old, old way of living and eating. And it feels new to us again. So you you get, you know, some experts in air quotes saying, oh, this is a fad. This is, you know, this is this is the latest fad diet. But this is actually the diet that we have been eating like you put on your dry erase board for, you know, three feet and and 11 inches of this four foot board. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think it's also important to to let my listeners know too, who aren't in the medical industry, that you got to keep in mind. So let's say you have your typical um, family practice doctor, and he's got a staff of five or six, and he needs to because of the forty different insurance companies out there that are going to pay different rates. He and the people he has to hire to to look into that and figure out how to how to get paid at the most they can get paid. He's got to cram his schedule full of patients. And, and when I worked yes. at Family Medicine up in New York, I was, I, I was seeing a patient like, gosh, I want to say two patients every 15 minutes. So that's what, eight patients an hour. I mean, just boom, one room, mm -hmm. boom, one room. Yep. And I would come in and I would say, hey, Joe, uh, let's look at your insulin. All right, your A1C is creeping up a little bit. Maybe we've got to adjust your insulin up, blah, 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 blah. How's your wife? Okay, I'll see you in three months. And, and yep. there's no, no time to sit there and explain things. And... and that's that's in the system. I mean, there's no way you can go around that. Uh, it, it's because if I did, if I stopped and said, "All right, Joe, let's talk about this." You know, what's changed? Why is your AMC creeping up? You know, what what are you eating? What are your what's your stress level? Are you sleeping well? Are you getting eight hours of sleep? If I start doing that, now I'm going 20 minutes with a patient. I got a waiting room filled with people, and I have a boss that's looking at me saying, "I'm trying to run a business here, get people in and out, work, you know, churn these patients," and it's. It's ter I mean, it's terrible in one way, um, but it's kind of the system in the other way. It's hard to, it's hard to break through that. Absolutely. As in, uh, like in my clinic uh, where, that I practice in, I have to see 40 or 50 people a day sure. to pay all the bills and to pay my employees. That has to happen. And so that's why I kind of started the, the YouTube channel and the Facebook page is so that I can give the correct advice because I may not be able to give it in the seven or eight or 10 minutes that I spend with you in my clinic, but I can give you a handout that says, hey, check out this YouTube channel because I got a ton of videos that you can actually learn how you're supposed to eat and how you're supposed to live. That's fantastic. That, That's great. Yeah, people really love that. And then I've got the Facebook page. I'm always posting articles from other people like Nina and like uh, Jason Fung, who I, I revere very much. Uh, I think that that's how doctors can go outside of that seven to 10 minute time constraint and still get the bills paid and still get their employees, you know, not have to lay anybody off because, and that's part of that uncomfortableness I was talking about. And this is how I found to get around that because I obviously don't want to start laying off employees. Right. I obviously don't want to start, you know, getting laid on my payments. And so I have to see that many people in the clinic. Yeah. And so then after hours or before hours or sometimes at lunch, I'll knock off a YouTube video about just like I just posted one about the three tests that you can do to detect early insulin resistance and early prediabetes so that you don't have to have the damage done for years and years before your doctor finally checks an A1C and finds, oh, it's 7.2. Oh, my gosh, you you know, we need to do something about that. Sure. Well, the damage has been done for the last decade and you're just now finding it out. It'd be nice if that patient could have found that out with a home test 10 years before that, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to do and trying to teach my patients and then more and more teach the world, hey, you don't have to just wait 
for this guy who's hurried and behind and in a bad mood because he, you know, he had a fight with his wife this morning and then he just forgot that he's like, Oh, we'll check labs next time. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, then you're running around with, with, you know, diabetes, type That's two right. diabetes, and you don't, don't even know it because it hasn't been checked. And, and there's the, and you touched on something there too. There's also the, you know, it's not a nine to five job. There were times where I'm at home watching the football game, writing notes, you know, writing charts, yes, uh, filling exactly. all this. So yep. it's just, it's just continuous. And it, and it, I guess that's the setup of medicine. I was lucky enough. Um, I came down to North Carolina, I was up in New York and I got offered a position in North Carolina where the County said, Hey, you know, we're spending tons of money for people with sniffles and sprained ankles going to the emergency room or urgent care and getting charged up the Yazoo for simple things. Why don't you come down here? We'll pay you a flat rate. We'll give you an assistant, and you just take care of those things. And so I came Ooh, down. Gosh. Oh, it was fantastic. But here's the thing. I have a captured audience, we'll call it that, or, or whatever that's called. And uh, I have a, a very fixed patient base. And I started noticing as people were coming in, you know, uh, it, it would surprise me if I saw someone with a BMI less than 24. Most of my BMIs are between 30 and 45 mm -hmm. every now and then in that overweight range, but the majority were, were heavy. And I'm saying, and then this is about the time when I, I got familiar with Rob Wolf and read his book and, and, and heard what he did with the Reno Fire Department and stuff. And I started seeing this opportunity, you know, I'm not profit driven. I can sit there and schedule 45 minutes to let's just talk about your sleep. You know, let's just talk. Let's let's hit that. Let's just check that off and see if we can work on that. And my patients can come to me. They don't have to worry about spending co-pays or, or spending out of pocket. It's it's and, and they're on the clock, too. So they can leave their desk and come and see me. And the payoff is the county isn't paying $2,000 years to uh, excuse me, $2,000 a year extra in say blood pressure medicine or $14,000 right. a year extra for diabetic medicine, because I'm able to, at least, at least this is my goal. I'm able to, you know, cut off these disease processes before they, they get to that point. And it's, it's, I'm so lucky as a, as a provider, but I'm starting to hear more of this. I'm starting to hear more of these companies saying, all right, let's work outside of insurance and let's bring mm -hmm. people on. And I think, I think hopefully that's a trend that we're going to start seeing. I think it will be. I think it will continue. I think there's going to be more independent uh, arrangements between doctors and patients. And then there's going to be more independent arrangements between uh, businesses and corporations and uh, physicians and other caregivers and, and teachers to go outside of the, the, the standard insurance paradigm and also the governmental paradigm. Because obviously both of those leads to increased cost and increased chronic disease because that's mm -hmm. what we've had over the last 50 years since we've had those. So, you know, the, the, the correlation there is very strong. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it caused it, but it sure is correlated, isn't it? So, yeah, so, yeah. yeah I think you're right. I think you're going to see more and more that, that uh, local governments and, you know, small corporations say, you know, our people are sick. They're going to the doctor all the time. They're on all these medicines. They're killing us on our health insurance that we, you know, we have to pay this huge part of, let's see if we can't hire this guy or that guy to, to teach these people so that maybe they can get off some of these medicines and not have that heart attack and not have to be on dialysis and not, you know, not have a stroke. Right. And that would save us a ton of money. And again, they're not worried about their employees, actual health. They're worried about the bottom line, that's but right. that's okay. But yeah. That's a corporation. Ultimately do. that, that, that matters to the patient's health. Sure. And, and I guess I have to be careful what I say here, but the, the system, too, unwittingly is designed to collapse on itself. I mean, there's only so far that this yep. current system of disease and treatment, disease and treatment, instead of prevention and prevention, it's disease and treatment. Eventually, the, the, just the, the cost of that is going to crumble the system. There was a... Yes. There was a um, uh, general, I can't remember his name. It was just, I want to say it was this year, maybe last year that said our healthcare crisis, not, not speaking. I know insurance is the big buzz term now, but, uh, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, all that is a national security threat. And I don't remember what date he gave. So let's call it 2030. It's going to bankrupt the system. Our system is going right. to be focused on treating illness rather than protecting our borders. Yeah, and I think he's absolutely right. I remember when that uh, the report came out. And yeah, you can't have a country that's sick, 
overweight on five medications, you know, has already lost a toe, is blind because of uncontrolled diabetes, you know, has already had uh, renal damage because of uncontrolled hypertension. First of all, that's going to break the system financially. But then also, if you ever did have to to put up or shut up, so to, so to speak, you who's going to who's going to be on the front lines? That's right. The guys with one leg or the guys who are, you know, are blind or who have to say, wait, time out. I got to go get my dialysis. Yeah. I mean, this is about to become a threat to our entire way of life, mm-hmm. not just financially, but in other ways as well. And that's why I think you're starting to see this groundswell because all of this stuff that you and I are talking about is not coming from the top down. And I want everyone to remember that. This is a groundswell that this is people on Instagram. This is people on Twitter. This is, this is, you know, not even doctors. There's one guy in Cookville, Tennessee. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but his name's Butter Bob. Uh-huh. And, and he, he made this YouTube video called Butter Makes Your Pants fall off oh i, I have he, heard of that yeah yeah and he's he's like works in a factory in cookville tennessee he's got no medical degree whatsoever but he's a very sharp guy mm-hmm. and he was morbidly obese and very sick and felt miserable and he's like what the crap my doctor's not helping me at all with this i've got to figure this out on my own mm-hmm. and he did and he started making youtube videos and he he's got millions of views and so butter bob who's basically a factory worker from cookville tennessee is giving infinitely better nutrition <laughs> advice than the American Heart Association, than the American Diabetic Association, and then uh, much better than just what your regular doctor would give you. He's giving you the answer, the answer that's going to fix your obesity permanently, is going to cure you of your type 2 diabetes. This guy, this factory worker, is blowing the curve for the, the AHA and the ADA and your and your local doctor. He's yeah. killing the curve for these guys. And I want everyone to remember this when this does reach the tipping point and become mainstream. I want everyone to be a little resistant to letting the American Heart Association kind of adopt this and say, well, this is kind of what we've been saying all along. Because <laughs> it's not. It's not at all. And yeah. I, want, I want there to be I want there to be I want there to be ramifications for the for the authorities in air quotes there again, who have been spouting this whole grain, high carb, low saturated fat ignorance for the last 50 years. I want those guys to hurt a little bit because of all the death and disease that they've caused. And you might, you might have figured out by now, I kind of speak plainly. Yeah. Yeah. These guys, these guys with their, their collaborations with the big pharma, they've killed people. They've caused Mm. disease. They've caused people to lose their family members because they didn't want to buck the system. And I think there should be a blowback from that. Do you know what's a, a, a kind of a, a litmus test to how well this is being perceived by society is you walk around Walmart, and I, I pointed this out to my wife, um, you can start to see on the shelves grass-fed butter. I saw that the other day and yeah. I was shocked. Grass-fed yep. butter. Um, uh, what do you call that? Bro- not broccoli. Um, uh, cauliflower rice, cauliflower pizza crust. I'm starting to see paleo-type mm-hmm. things on the mm-hmm. shelves there. And Walmart isn't a nefarious organization. Their, their thing is bottom line. So if you're, that's right. if you're buying it, they're stocking it. It's always a good place to, to see where society is going. You know, if you start seeing more, and I remember Atkins kind of had a resurgence back in, I want to say the nineties, but then Mm -hmm. their shelves filled with Atkins stuff. Um, so, so it's good. I think the message is getting out. I think people are hearing it. Um, and more importantly, they're trying it and they're starting to feel better, and that's going to yeah. drive the market. Yeah. And yeah. and hopefully yeah. the doctors will start seeing that. And um, let me ask you a quick question. Well, I have, I have two here, but the first one is: uh, you wrote lies that my doctor, or is it lies my doctor told me? Yes, I've it written down right there. Okay. Um, how, did you write that with some trepidation? Were you nervous? Uh, how, what was it? Was it your um, Jerry Maguire moment? Tell me about it, the, the process and then getting it published and the, the pucker factor you, I would assume you had as it went out. <laughs> well, and I should have, but I didn't much. My wife uh, was very worried about that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I typically feel like that if, if what I'm saying is truthful and I'm justified in saying it, then I'm, I'm – perfectly happy to let the cards fall where they may. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there were people around me and, and, you know, colleagues are like, dude, are you not afraid to publish this? I mean, you're stepping on a lot of toes here. And I'm like, yeah, and they justifiably need to be stepped on. So I'm fine with that. Right. Uh, So yeah, even back when I was in my fourth year of medical school, my first, my intern year, first year of residency, 
I would hear things that I would go, wait a minute, what? And I've always been a reader. I've, I was a, a radiologic technologist before I went to med school. So I've always, I was always been kind of paramedical mm-hmm. and have been very interested in reading and, and, and also reading far outside of my specialty. And, you know, not only just reading about medicine, but, uh, but reading about uh, anthropology and reading about heuristics and reading about, you know, all these ways that humans think. One of my favorite classes in college was logic. I took a logic class. It was one of the most valuable courses I ever took because it helped me understand that human beings are ridiculous in the way they think sometimes, but it seems perfectly logical until you point out the fallacy. And so one of the very first lies that I ever encountered in medical school was I was on uh, an OBGYN rotation. We deliver babies and we're the, that night, and then the next morning we do the circumcision, then we start sending people home. And the chief resident said, don't forget to write the vitamin D drops for the, the newborns, you know, as a prescription. And I'm like, what do you mean vitamin D drops? He said, well, mothers don't make vitamin D in their breast milk. And so you have to supplement them or they'll get rickets. And I was like, OK, all right, I'll do that. But and it, immediately my spidey sense went up. and I was like, what? Yeah. How does that make any evolutionary sense whatsoever? So you're telling me for the last 100,000 years, kids have just gotten rickets and died all the time because – Nobody was there to, you know, there's no pharmacy to fill the, the vitamin D drops. Right. And, but I didn't have time to research it at the time. And also, you know, as a fourth year medical student or an intern, you don't argue. You just do as you're told and you, you learn what you're taught and you move on. And so when I did get time to look into that, when I first started my practice, there was a doctor in the Carolinas who also thought that was ridiculous. And he did a study and he found out that when you give mothers 6,000 international units of vitamin D, a day, guess what they make in their breast milk? They make plenty of vitamin D for their baby, but all mothers are deficient in vitamin D. So you can't put something in your breast milk if you're deficient in it as well. And so every doctor before me, every single one, you know, the, the intern, the resident, the chief resident, the attending, all of them heard that same thing I heard. You know, you have to prescribe vitamin D drops for the baby. And I was the only one in the room that went, what the hell? What? (laughs) Everybody else said, okay, yeah, that's exactly right. You have to do that. But but there's a study that's very well done, very large number of women, and he shows beyond doubt that if a woman will just get 6,000 units of vitamin D and she can get it from the sun, she can get it from her food or get it from a supplement, then she makes plenty of vitamin D in her breast milk for her baby. That's how we did it 100,000 years ago. We were out in the sun playing all day. We ate all the fat that we could get our hands on, and that's where vitamin D is stored mm-hmm. in animals is in the fat. And so they got they had plenty of vitamin D, and that's why your great-great-great-great-grandfather didn't have rickets when he was a baby. It was because his mom had plenty of vitamin D. And, that's, that's a, and that sort of – go well, ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that's a perfect microcosm to almost every disease process. You know Exactly right. That's right. And that's uh, that kind of set up my paradigm of thinking about this from that day forward. And so then the next one I came across early in my practice was that if you have diverticulosis, you should avoid nuts and seeds and popcorn because that can flare up your diverticulosis and cause diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's so weird that something as natural as eating, you know, nuts and seeds would cause a disease process to get worse. That's so weird. And so I got to looking into this, and there's actually been a humongous study done that proves beyond doubt that not only do nuts and seeds not cause diverticulitis, they actually prevent it. Wow. What causes diverticulitis is being obese, smoking, and processed foods. Sure. That's that's proven. There's a huge study that had like 24,000 participants. There's no doubt about that. And just if the average person Googles, does the seeds and nuts cause diverticulitis, they can learn this answer in, in three minutes of reading on Google. But the average doctor, even the gastroenterologist, will still tell people to this very day, this study was done in 2014. 12 or 2014 Mm -hmm. still. And it was published in, in, in JAMA or New England journal. I can't remember which, but still to this day, the, in my uh, metropolitan city that I refer people to, I'll have people come back from the gastroenterologist being told avoid nuts and seeds. So you don't flare up your diverticulitis, Mm -hmm. even though it's absolute myth, it's crap. It's not true. They're still telling patients. And that's in my opinion is a medical lie. If the research is there and you should know about it, but you don't, that's your job. Yeah. That's your job as a doctor to know that. And if you don't know that, that's not just a miss. You didn't just misspeak. That's not a myth. That's a damn lie. And you should be held accountable for that. 
So there was a lot of passion. So, there was a lot of passion coming yeah, leading up to this. Absolutely. And I'm and I'm like, you know, I'm almost to the point where I'm I'm willing to stand up and say, please come after me. Let's have this heard in an open forum. Wow. That you're telling people these these lies, lies of nutrition, lies of prevention, you know, all this crap that doctors tell patients. And then yet somehow I'm the bad guy. Come on. Let's 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 talk about this. So come come and get me. Let's talk about it. And uh, that that kind of talk makes my wife very nervous. But <laughs> sure. I'm, I feel like the patients deserve that because you know if you're if you're a mechanic or you're a housewife or you're a hairdresser, you don't have time to go and read all the medical literature and to give good medical advice. That's the damn doctor's job. Mm-hmm. And if they're not doing their job, shouldn't someone call their hand on it? Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic book. I encourage my uh, readers to to check it out. I, I just found it on Amazon. I just I'll link to it on my show notes here. But it's um, it's a great book, very readable, and it flies. I mean, I I knew what I was getting into when I started reading it. But if you don't know what you're getting into, you're gonna say what? <laughs> like it's a 180 from a lot of things. Um, here here's something else, and I don't know if you if what your experience is with this. Um, exercise. I have a lot of patients that come in. And they're shocked when I tell them, let's, it, it, I'm very big on sleep. I'm very, if you're, if you're into, you know, check your blood sugar, check your weight, check your fat, uh, and they're sleeping four hours a day and napping in the afternoon, they don't have a, a nice sleep schedule. I start with that. And I say, do you know what? Don't even exercise. Let's not get that stress in your life right now. Let's work on sleep. Okay. And then we'll work on yeah. diet. And then when we have a little extra time each day, um, what happened to me, so I worked, I worked very strenuously up until I was 35, you know, jujitsu, CrossFit to stay fit for jujitsu, um, things that were just tearing my joints apart. And I had this notion that the more fit I got, the more healthy I got. And there's a big rift between fitness and health. You, it's very hard Absolutely. to be both fit and healthy. You can be fit or healthy, and you might even be fit and somewhat healthy, but to, be, to get both is very tricky. Um, so something I do with my patients and, and, you know, they tell me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running for an hour a day and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not losing any weight. And that's, it's preposterous because again, I look back at that, that ancient man. And I say, if he was running for an hour a day, something was wrong, right? <laughs> something wasn't going Absolutely, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So he would never do that. That's exactly. exactly right. Yeah. So I get and my so patients. That's actually one of the. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. No, I, I, what I was just going to say gonna... is, is um, so I get my patients, this is my exercise routine, this is how I start them. I, I ran into these guys, check them out, um, at GMB Fitness, Gold Medal Bodies Fitness, um, Ryan Hurst is the guy who, who he's one of the runners, uh, runners. he's one of the um, uh, uh, proprietors of the, the website, but I discovered them when my shoulders just went to shit at age 35, and and what the exercise routine, and it was hard to shift myself from this because I was used to going hard, going long, you know, 45 minutes heart rate at 150. And now mm-hmm. I was spending 30 minutes on just stretching my shoulders. And that was my exercise routine for the day. And then doing a downward dog and holding it for, you know, 45 seconds and holding it for five minutes. That was my daily exercise. And it shocked me. To do that, I thought I was getting less healthy, but then what happened and what slowly happened with me doing these, like literally spending 15 minutes just doing bear crawls, my shoulders mm-hmm. got stronger, my joints stopped hurting, um, I was sleeping better, I, and my overall health improved by decreasing my exercise. And that's a huge one that I think only because the, the, the exercise world wants you to think that the more exercise you do, the healthier you're going to be. And and so basically what I'm getting at here is you have the medical world and you also have this world that's trying to sell you health that is right. also biting off on the wrong the wrong thing. And it's hard to ke- teach my patients not to do that. Do you run into that? I do all the time. And there's actually a chapter in the book about the myth that exercise or the lie that exercise will make you lose weight. And that's another thing that's been studied very thoroughly in very large, well-done medical studies and been disproven time and time again. And so if somebody's – and I think in America that's why we've almost stopped making New Year's resolutions because the way we've been taught improperly makes us make the wrong resolutions. And so if you're 20 pounds overweight, you're like, okay, January 1, I'm joining the gym and I'm going to start running on the treadmill for an hour a day and I'm going to lose this weight. Well, guess what? 
that would be exactly like saying, okay, January 1, I'm 20 pounds overweight. I'm going to start, you know, sitting on the couch for an extra hour a day, and that's going to help me lose this weight. Nice, right. Because they, they both do exactly the same thing when it comes to weight loss. Mm-hmm. And now I always have to say this. I'm not saying exercise is not good for you. Exercise is wonderful for the human body. It's vital for your brain. It's vital to prevent dementia. It's, it helps you in hundreds and hundreds of ways. But it's been proven beyond all doubt, if you look at the, the literature, exercise does not make you lose weight. Mm-mm. That's that's just a, a fact. And, and, but yet your doctor will say, well, and it all ties back into the calorie myth. Well, you've just got to burn more calories than you eat. And so to do that, you, you're more active. You have to exercise. You have to run on the treadmill. But that never works. Calorie restriction never leads to meaningful long-term weight loss, ever. It's been proven time and time again. I'm sure you've heard of the women, the Women's Health Initiative. Oh, yeah. Yep. Huge study. Huge study. And I actually – read it early you know early in my career I, I looked at it and read all the you know the findings and stuff and it and i had the wrong paradigm then i wasn't looking at it with the right eyes mm-hmm. but then here comes jason fung along and he looks at the research and that same research and you can't argue with his finding it's right there in black and white and he says there's a huge arm of this study where the women were calorie restricted like 300 calories a day for years and we all know that if you burn 3500 calories that's a pound right we've mm-hmm. all been taught that mm-hmm. well that's that's baloney because these women were calorie restricted 300 calories a day for i think seven years it was a and long so they study. should have lost about what 215 pounds yeah they should have lost 215 pounds but they they wound up losing a half of a kilogram versus the women who didn't calorie restrict at all mm-hmm over seven years. So to think I'm going to cut back on my calories and exercise more, that's your two New Year's resolutions. Guess what? You're going to fail. And I think in America, that's why we've almost stopped making resolutions because when I was a kid, that was a big thing. Everybody would write their 10 resolutions down and you know that you would you would mail them to yourself or you would hide them somewhere so you could check yourself later in the year. Mm-hmm. And people don't even do that anymore because it's just stupid because you're not going to, you know, you're not going to reap any benefits of that. But it's because we've been making the wrong resolutions because we've been taught the wrong information, both by the doctors and by the, the federal government and by those gurus you spoke of who are trying to make a million bucks selling the newest piece of exercise equipment. Oh, it makes me so mad. And you know, it's, it's a hard sell to say, Hey, if you'll, if you'll get on this thing and, and sweat like a dog for an hour, three times a week, you'll prevent Alzheimer's dementia 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sell many units. Right. If you, if, that, if that's your ad play, right? But if you say, Hey, you you know, you can lose weight. Like something's wrong with you. If you would do this thing three times a week. Yeah, everybody's going to sign up for that because we're all overweight. Plus, if your yardstick for improvement is, you know, some CrossFit athlete whose diet is probably spot on, um, mm-hmm. then you're, you're you're shooting yourself in your foot. But if your yardstick of success is I can crawl on the ground with my three year old and wrestle with them for thirty minutes and not be sore and not be out of breath, then there you go. I mean, looking in the mirror and I, I had Jason Sebon. Um, I don't know, I guess it was at the end of the this year, end of 2017. And he brought up a huge point that that I never considered until actually I spoke with him. I, I it must have been the 29th or 30th, somewhere around there of December. I never considered till I sat down and spoke with him about the psychological aspect of weight loss. I know it sounds obvious, but he was seeing a lot of his patients. He had a great diet program, a great um, fitness program, but people were still giving up. And the reason why they were giving up is because basically looking in the mirror and saying, you know, they were, they were trying to stand or, or, or um, compare themselves to something that either is not attainable or just doesn't exist in nature, or they reached a point and there was no rainbows and puppy dogs and they said, well, right. I, I'm not feeling good, so why am I bothering doing this? So that, that's an entirely, uh, I guess that's an entirely new conversation. Um, but still, I mean, it, it, it's pertinent and I think it, it's also part of the... Um, the problem. Well, uh, Dr. Barry, I took a lot of your time. Uh, this is, <laughs> we had a little back and forth trying to get on here, but we finally got the interview. I think it went, um, very well. Uh, where can my listeners find you and, um, and, and get schooled by the, the, I'll call it the Barry method. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have a Facebook page and a YouTube page. That's where I do most of my outreach. Because I can, like I said, I can only help 40 or 50 people a day in my clinic. Mm-hmm. But with the YouTube page and the Facebook page, and I also have Twitter and Instagram, I do, I can reach thousands. And right. I can help thousands of people without 
you know, bankrupting my clinic by spending the amount of time I should be spending with patients. So the Facebook page, my handle is KendiBerry.md. And then on the YouTube channel, my handle is KendiBerryMD with no dots. Okay. And then uh, the book is on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle, and it's called Lies My Doctor Told Me. It's a great book. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And my favorite part was uh, the end there where you just gave your little lies, where it's like, these are the white lies that you've heard throughout your whole life. They're not true. And uh, right. I, I love that section because... It's it's like when, as a provider, I'm at Christmas and, you know, my cousin says, hey, you know, you only you use 10% of your brain. <laughs> I, right. I roll my eyes and be like, all right, listen, that's, you know, you don't want to be that guy at the party, but finally you put it in writing and say, here it is. All right. Here's the deal. Yeah, if yeah. you have a concussion. So you don't have to be that guy at the party. You can just give them a copy of my book. There you, you go. You don't have to be that guy. <laughs> that, that works fantastic. <laughs> all right, Dr. Barry, thank you very much. Again, very, very um, much appreciated that you came on the show here. Um, it's one one life at a time. That's how I look at it. Uh, I try to, you know, I look at my county and I come home and I say, you know, ah, you know, did I reach enough people? Do I reach enough people? And really it comes down to if you change one person, they can perhaps change someone else or people will see the results in their life and say, hey, what are you doing? And then, you know, who knows? Uh, and, and, and that's part of the beauty of what we're doing here is when somebody actually applies what we're talking about, they get results. And that makes people very happy to share this with their friends and family because it worked for them and it was effortless and they feel better. And so, yeah, they're happy to share. So word of mouth is huge. And that's part of this groundswell. Sure. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks so much for having me. Let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. All right. All right. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Like us on facebook.com slash WWI podcast and at WWI podcast on Twitter. Drop us a line at waitswhatifpodcast at yahoo.com. Listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher or TuneIn Internet Radio. your listening experience. Now go forth and expand your reality.